Come on, guys. Give me some. Here's the North Pole. Check out this map of the Arctic from the 16th century. There are four major surrounding a with a map. And it's the Go up closer with your phone. Uh, quick, quick, sir. Dot com. Story for more. Find dozens. Cornelis de Yoda in 1593. Another from one of the East India. Pontius in 94. Example. Abraham. Lisa. Yeah, there you go. That map right there. Being a flat earther, they don't talk about it too much. Hmm. This is too. What you got going on there? Cut out YouTube. That's YouTube. Yeah. He's going through and trying to find out the guy who talks about it. Oh, okay. Hmm. It's been so long since I researched this stuff, like, I don't know, like 15 years ago. The music conspiracy guru does a lot of funny videos about it. <laughs> But he talks about the space end of it, the space exploration. Kirk Watson, been my home. For people who live here. You see online on social media. I don't think I've ever spoken about flat Earth. Like the flat earth theory. I don't think I've ever done a video about it. Might have not even mentioned it in a video before. So today we're going to be talking about why I personally believe keyboard there is personal. Agree with me. We can't. Why? It's. Jeez. What is with the signal? What is with the what? My signal. I didn't. I don't. He's. Let's see. They are cutting the signal so bad, dude. It's entirely ridiculous. It's probably because I got my. It's in my cup. I got my you phone. And my cup. Ah. Uh, Yeah. See that little hole right there? There's a hole just like that. Dead center. And it's been there. Um, it's frozen expanse. It basically breathes in and out. And it waves the ocean. Yeah. Is it this one? The Earth is not flat. It's shaped. The core. Not in fact a multi-dimensional living sphere, because they want to keep you away from truth. So, yes, they.
thirties. No, what are you doing? Where the hell is it? Is it that? Talk about Yeah, they don't there's only a few guys on here that are probably paid to talk about this shit. But the rest yeah. of them they easy used to talk about normal shit they are not on here anymore. Uh -huh. But all I see is these 90k, 24.4 million, Professor Dave explains. A lot of the footage has been taken down of the couple spots that I know of. Of video of that actual water hole that's massive. That looks like a cave underneath an ocean that's just open that water is draining into. And it's a yeah. massive deal. I've seen video of it in several spots, but now I can't find the videos of it. So, I mean, yeah. what does that tell you? It's almost like that right there. But, Seth, if, if you can imagine like, just water flowing through. Uh, yeah, they're hiding on it. Yep. Look at it from the... <laughs> what? Look at that. That's funny. The hole from the North Pole could be seen on a satellite. <laughs> this is a cool one. Most of my videos focus on one or a set of related maps, but in this video, we're going to random old map to the 19th. Find it. So you think you know Wix? Shush. A Dutch cartographer a large commercial atlas. Some say that during this America is. in the world by volume of water and by bacteria it is the largest lake in south Africa. and they have you seen this one drew what 3346 long it's called the first ever footage from beyond the ice wall of antarctica terrifies the whole world it's on youtube five mm -hmm. months ago play it how weird Oh, you want me to play it? All right, well, let's uh, put some volume on it. And puzzles that nobody has solved for a long time. Some people think it hides old treasures that have been lost for ages. Others guess there might be secret places or strange creatures at the very edge of the world. Join us on this adventure as we delve into the terrifying mu muster beyond the ice wall. As scientists venture deeper into the uncharted territory of Antarctica, they encounter extreme cold and unsolved mysteries. Speculations emerge regarding the secrets concealed beyond its icy borders. Some believe ancient treasures lie buried beneath the snow, waiting to be discovered. Others speculate about hidden realms or unknown creatures <laughs> inhabiting the far reaches of the continent. Join us on this thrilling expedition as we explore the cryptic world of Antarctica. Chapter 1. Captain Cook's legendary exploration. The land of Antarctica is a vast expanse of ice filled with secrets and stories and has been the backdrop for countless exciting journeys that have sparked the interest of many explorers and adventure seekers over the years. These journeys, fueled by a desire to learn scientific questions and the resilience of the human spirit, have expanded the limits of what we know revealing the hidden details of this far off and unwelcoming place. Among the earliest and most notable journeys to this region was led by Captain James Cook. In the 1700s, Captain Cook, a man who became a legend in sea exploration, rose from a simple background to become one of the leading navigators and map makers of his era. He was born in 1728 in Martin, Yorkshire, starting off in the British Merchant Navy as a young apprentice. He climbed up the career ladder in the Royal Navy his unmatched talent in finding his way at sea and creating maps, together with his never-ending curiosity, set him off on groundbreaking sea adventures. 
Captain Cook's first major sea journey took place between 1768 and 1771 on the ship HMS Endeavour. The main goals were to watch the Venus transit across the sun and to explore the vast Pacific Ocean. This journey was significant because Cook's findings improved our knowledge of world geography and sea travel, which influenced later explorations, including those near the cold waters of Antarctica. From 1772 to 1775, his second journey was aboard the HMS Resolution and the HMS Adventure. Oh. This time, Captain Cook aimed to find a mysterious land called Terra Australis Incognita, meaning unknown southern land. Ooh. Although his ship sailed close to the Antarctic Circle and covered a large area of the southern ocean, they never actually saw Antarctica itself. The third journey took place between 1776 and 1779, with Cook again at the helm of the HMS Resolution, accompanied by the HMS Discovery. This expedition aimed to discover a passage linking the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans in the north. Even during this voyage, Cook did not come across Antarctica, focusing instead. Ross's name became closely linked with some of the most critical findings in Antarctic history. One first mate. We've got passion, we've got determination. <laughs> and if we say that, Bob did do another you commercial. Welcome to you, too. Major Antarctic adventure happened between 1928 and 1930, known as the First Bird Antarctic Expedition. Here, he set up Little America, a base on the Ross Ice Shelf. And from there, he flew over Antarctica, gathering data and mapping out the land. Bird's flights over Antarctica helped us know more about this frozen land and opened doors for later expeditions. That's an actual His photo. next big trip. The second bird Antarctic expedition from 1933 to 1935 made him even more famous. On this journey, Bird flew over the South Pole on November 29, 1929, in the Floyd Bennett airplane, marking a historic moment as the first person to do so. This flight brought him fame and secured his place as a legendary explorer. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by frozen seas. The south, the bottom of the world, is considerably colder in the top of the world. But Bird's adventures didn't stop there. He led another important mission, the United States Antarctic Service Expedition from 1939 to 1941. With years of polar experience, Bird aimed to do more than explore. He focused on scientific research in areas like weather, rocks, ice studies, animal life, and the sea, along with mapping unknown parts of Antarctica. His team also worked on improving the gear, vehicles, and ways to live in such a cold place, setting standards for those who would follow into the icy wilderness. Thus, we turn our attention to Operation High Jump, an important chapter in the history of Antarctic exploration. Huh. Operation High Jump was a massive project you undertaken know. by the United States Navy from 1946 to 1947, undertaken standards for those who would follow into the icy wilderness. Thus, I never thought of this before. Submarines without the tops. We turn our attention to Operation High Jump, an important chapter in the history of Antarctic exploration. Operation High Jump was a massive project undertaken by the United States Navy from 1946 to 1947. Under the leadership of Admiral Byrd, it became the most extensive Antarctic mission of its time. The mission's goals were to study the area, set up research stations, try out military gear in the cold, and showcase American presence in Antarctica. This operation came right after World War II and showcased an impressive array of resources. Numerous ships, planes, and over 4,000 people, including military personnel, scientists, and support staff. The fleet was impressive, featuring an aircraft carrier. Have a good night, AJ. Thanks for hanging with us, brother. Key plane tenders, helicopters, cargo ships, and more. The operation has sparked stories, partly due to the immense military force displayed in such a remote location. This show of strength led to rumors, including those suggesting that German forces might still be active in Antarctica, stemming from their own expeditions in the late 1930s aimed at mapping and exploring the continent. 
Although the war interrupted much of this activity, leaving little evidence, speculation about German operations and their supposed secret technologies in Antarctica persists. Similarly, Admiral Byrd himself has been the center of various debates and theories, particularly regarding his statements and experiences in Antarctica. Unlike common conspiracy theories, some of these stories come directly from Admiral Byrd. In an interview on the TV program, Long Gines Chronoscope, Byrd shared his experiences and observations. Oh, wow. In the show, Frank Knight introduces Admiral Byrd, highlighting his status as a prominent explorer who opened new frontiers in the Arctic and Antarctic. Is there any secret? Is there uranium there? That would be the only thing that would be practical to uh, actually go after, I suppose. Everything else would be economically uh, unfeasible. Well, as we recklessly extend our resources, the time will come. We can we will have to go after that stuff. Bird then speaks. Oh, we've got about Jeez. 50 million followers. We're in the billions of views. And we're a small tank speaks about the unexplored territories remaining on Earth, particularly an area as large as the United States, beyond the South Pole, untouched and unseen by humans. What was weird about Antarctica? You can't go to the interior of Antarctica, which is where we were. No. There, at the South Pole, there is a bunch of, from my understanding, like pure science going on there. This revelation underlines the vast mystery that Antarctica still holds, suggesting immense, untapped potential in terms of resources and knowledge. Bird's comments hint at the global interest in these hidden riches and the continuing allure of the Antarctic for adventurers and nations alike. Next, we'll learn about the Antarctic Treaty, where countries agreed on rules for peace and science in Antarctica. Yeah. Chapter 4. The Disturbing part. Secrets Behind the Antarctic Peaks. The interview with Admiral Byrd on the Longines Chronoscope was broadcast on December 8, 1954. Just under five years after this broadcast, a significant international agreement, the Antarctic Treaty, was signed on December 1, 1959. This treaty changed how countries could interact with Antarctica, being celebrated as a prime example of global collaboration. The main points of the treaty were aimed at ensuring peace, supporting scientific research, and protecting the unique environment of Antarctica. The treaty clarified that Antarctica was to be used only for peaceful purposes, strictly banning any military actions, creating military bases, or weapon testing in the area. It encouraged countries to work together in their scientific endeavors, allowing them to freely conduct research and share their findings. Isn't it interesting that they can declare peace in an area and it just becomes that? Just that easy. I wonder why they don't declare peace here. You know, if it's that easy and all. Ain't that a bitch. Ain't that a bitch. with the world. It ensured that no new territorial claims would be made and existing claims would not be recognized or disputed while the treaty was in effect. Moreover, the treaty put a strong emphasis on preserving the natural environment of Antarctica. It set rules against any activities that could harm the ecosystem, like pollution or improper waste management. The agreement also set up regular meetings between the countries that signed the treaty. These meetings were meant to discuss how to govern Antarctica, plan scientific studies, and protect the environment. The treaty was made to last indefinitely, with opportunities to review and update its terms to remain effective and relevant. Originally signed by seven countries, including Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom, the treaty came into effect in 1961 and has since been joined by many other nations, bringing the total to 56. Due to the rules set by the Antarctic Treaty, private expeditions to the continent without official permission are illegal and can lead to penalties. Permission this from is who? a departure from the views shared by Admiral Byrd and the Longy. Permission from who? These chronoscope hosts, as the treaty <laughs> restricts <laughs> Antarctica. Permission from Uncle Scam. Permission from commercials. I got permission. Exploration to those with the necessary resources and approval. Now. Ah! I identify as having permission. Let me in. I said, let me in. I have, I have permission. 
The general public's access to Antarctica is typically through costly tourist cruises <laughs> that only touch the edges of the continent, offering a brief and limited experience. But the United Nations played a significant role in the treaty's establishment, reflecting its broader mission to foster peace, cooperation, and development worldwide since its formation in 1945 after World War II. Looking at the UN's emblem gives insight into its values and goals. It does. The emblem features a laurel wreath, a symbol of victory and peace, surrounding a map of the world. This design suggests a commitment to global unity and cooperation. Oh. However, interpretations of the emblem vary, with some seeing the wreath as a sign of control or limitation, I see representing grid. the boundaries of human reach and governance. Logos are not just pictures. They carry deeper meanings, ideas, or even hidden messages. They use symbols and shapes to convey information that has been passed down through the ages. These symbols don't need words to express their messages. They communicate through visual hints. Understanding the hidden message depends on interpreting the creator's intentions. Let's look at some examples to explain this concept. The logo of the World Economic Forum no. features the letter O crossed out several times. To those who know how to look, this could hint at the number 666, often associated with the beast from biblical texts. The Google Chrome logo, with its circular design, can be seen as representing an eye or a gateway. The arrangement and colors might suggest a repeating... When Google has three sixes in the name, the E is a six and the two Gs are six. ...pattern of the number six, again implying the number 666 when viewed a certain way. Then there's the PlayStation logo, where the P and S are designed in a way that could be seen as suggestive, leading some to question what the imagery truly represents. Damn, Another example is the Apple logo, reminiscent of the forbidden fruit from biblical stories, with the first product priced at $666, adding to the entry. No. Turning back to the United Nations logo, no. it shows the Earth from a top-down view suggesting a different perspective of our planet. Yeah. This design could imply a way of seeing the world that differs from the traditional map, with travel between countries visualized as moving in circles rather than straight lines. If this image were wrapped okay. around a globe, okay. it would align with the familiar world map, with Antarctica at the bottom encircling the land. This invites us to look at the world differently, see, suggesting that sometimes what we seek because might already... Because Antarctica on the globe on mine is at the bottom ready be in front of us. Let's move on to a different topic, how some people understand the Earth's shape based on the Bible. Chapter 5, The Untold Mysteries of Biblical Earth. The idea that the Earth might be different from what is commonly believed, such as in biblical cosmology, is not widely accepted. This chapter examines the work of Orlando Ferguson, who in the late 19th century created a map based on his interpretation of the Earth's shape according to the We've got passion, we've got determination. <laughs> okay, if we set our sights on something, you break in that money. money. I mean, golly, I bet these guys are doing good, huh? Intense. Wish they'd push my commercials like that. Born in 1845 in Madison, Wisconsin, Ferguson proposed a flat, square Earth model with the North Pole at the center, surrounded by continents. His 1893 map, Map of the Square and Stationary Earth, combined this concept like with a biblical quotes. To argue against Spin the globe. Table for that. Ferguson's work is underpinned by his deep faith and the belief that rejecting the Bible's no. words, Ferguson proposed a flat, square earth model Quick. with the North Okay, in the Bible it tells you there's four angels of four corners of the world. Yeah. You cannot get you cannot get four corners on a round on a round ball. You can only get it on a round pancake like that, and you have four corners on a square on God's pedestal. Huh. Five in Madison. That's what they're. Ferguson proposed. That's what they're showing on that one map. If you go back a little bit. Yeah. A little bit more. Work of Orlando Ferguson, who in the late 19th... ...contradicted the idea right there. of a spherical Earth. See how you got four corners? You got four angels in all four corners? Holy Grail.
I wonder who the four angels are. Um, I believe that map names them. If you go right there, I can't really see it, but the phone can. If I put the phone up against it, I'll be able to read it, I bet. Uh, nope. Stupid camera. Uh, almost can read it. Four angels sitting on the crown of the earth. Doesn't say their names. These men are flying on the globe at the rate of 65,000 miles per hour around the sun and 1,042 miles per hour Big around water. the center of the earth. Anyway, that, take this out. On the globe, you're on a 20, what is it, 23 point something degree on an access tilt, which equals uh, six, uh, 660, or I'm sorry, 66.6. Huh. Everything NASA th throws at you, the speed that we're going, space, everything like through, all the numbers they give us all equal 666. This dude copyright this in 1893. This is copyrighted. I hadn't seen this one. This one looks like roulette. It looks like a roulette table. And what does it tell you? Hmm? Stationary. Stationary. Yeah. So we are stationary. That, that means that the earth, the sun, the moon, and yeah. the stars rotate around us. Yeah. With, with the North Star being the fix, like it. It's, it's, it's if, if you took a, the the North Pole, all right, and then you added a bunch of little wires with a bunch of little lights, a bunch of little stars connected to it. Okay, everything turns on the ground North Star. The North Pole. That's where Mount Maru comes into play. The dead center of that. But go on. Hmm. It's interesting. It's a bowl, kind of. It's kind of like a. It's not even a bowl. It's like a. Uh, what it? What do you describe it? Like a muffin pan, like a bunt cake pan. <laughs> the basis of this belief is that Jesus Christ is central to faith and truth, likened to the cornerstone of all creation. According to this view, understanding the world's design as described in the Bible reveals the true nature of our environment. The discussion then shifts to the book of Job, particularly chapter 38, where God speaks to Job out of a whirlwind, questioning his understanding of the earth's creation. This passage suggests that humans, with their limited knowledge, cannot fully grasp God's design for the foundations mouth. of the earth. These verses imply that the earth has set measurements, fixed foundations, and defined corners, challenging the conventional view of a round planet. Additionally, the scripture mentions the morning stars and sons of God as witnesses to the earth's creation, suggesting a celestial audience during the formation of the world. This interpretation emphasizes the literal understanding of the Bible's words, seeing them as factual descriptions rather than symbolic language. Ferguson and like-minded individuals believe that the true shape and structure of the earth are described in these ancient texts, which detail a creation that is vastly different from the mainstream scientific view. Moving on to the book of Revelation, we find a passage that ties back to the idea of the earth having corners. Revelation chapter seven mentions four angels standing at the earth's four corners, controlling the winds so that they do not blow on the land sea, or trees. This image supports the concept of a flat earth with defined edges, as depicted on Orlando Ferguson's map, and relates to earlier biblical mentions of the earth's structure. Returning to the concept of foundation in the Bible, we revisit Job, this time chapter 22. This passage speaks of God's supremacy and presence above the earth and the stars, emphasizing his oversight from the heavens 
It contrasts the divine foundation with that of the wicked, whose flawed foundations were destroyed by the flood. This shows how foundation can mean different things. The physical world, moral standings, or even individuals' lives, depending on the context. In Psalms, particularly Psalm 102, foundation refers to the creation of the earth and heavens by God, who is eternal and unchanging. This scripture reinforces the belief in a structured creation, with the earth and multiple layers of heaven crafted by God's hands. Genesis chapter 1 describes the creation of life and birds flying in the firmament of heaven, which is seen as the sky or space below the higher heavens where God resides. This distinction indicates there are different levels or areas within the heavens, each serving different purposes according to biblical descriptions. In Isaiah chapter 48, it suggested that the earth has a flat base and the heavens stretch wide, showing the shape of our world. The chapter states that God laid the earth's foundation and stretched out the heavens. The term span here implies a straight, flat measurement, like stretching a hand across a flat surface, not a curved one. Moving on to the firmament or sky, Job chapter 37 compares it to strong, clear glass. This comparison suggests the sky is like a flat, transparent dome over the earth. When we spread something out, like dough or a tablecloth, we do it on a flat surface, not a round one. This implies the sky stretches over the earth in a flat, even layer. Genesis chapter 1 explains the creation of light, separating day from night, and the formation of the firmament, a dome dividing the waters above from those below. This separation created the sky and the sea, with the firmament supporting the waters above, much like a dome can hold more weight than a flat surface because of its shape. The firmament's clearness lets us see through to the blue sky or the dark night, depending on whether there's light. The stars appear to twinkle not because they change, but because we're looking at them. What if we're looking at the firmament and holes in the firmament seeing the light through heaven? Just saying. Through this dome, like sunlight reflecting off water. This explanation ties back to the idea that the earth and heavens have a distinct flat and domed structure. Revisiting the concept of the firmament described as glass, it seems this is why the sky can appear like a vast sea when viewed from above. In Revelation 4, the area around God's throne is described as a sea of glass, clear like crystal. This imagery suggests the sky, or firmament, is not just a barrier, but a platform reflecting God's glory. When light passes through clear materials oh, like boy. glass or crystal, it bends, a process Yes. So this is very interesting to me because this is where perception changes reality. When you put something in a vacuum, light doesn't act the same and sound doesn't act the same. So you can't see light the same and you can't hear sound the same. So the things that you think are real are in fact not real real or elevated so sound sound exceeds the speed of light in a vacuum and vice versa happens in a pressurized environment so it's interesting to know that and then know from weather people and what we know about weather and the barometric pressure how much pressure changes and how much our vision can change because of that, and sound can change. Called refraction. This bending can break the light into all the colors of the rainbow. In Ezekiel chapter 1, the firmament is described as shining crystal, emphasizing its awe-inspiring fearful color. This terrible or awe-inspiring crystal reflects the overwhelming presence and glory of God, similar to how Moses' face shone after speaking with God. Huh. Ezekiel describes the throne of God above the firmament, shining with colors like amber and surrounded by fire. That's a pretty dang good video. Similar to a rainbow. This vivid imagery underlines the divine origin of the light and color seen in the sky. So when you see the northern lights, think of them as a display of God's magnificence, his light shining through the dome of the firmament doesn't that look kind of like the Ark of Covenant? Doesn't the Ark of the Covenant have a seat in the middle with four angels on each side? I think, I mean, nobody really knows, right? But I mean, that's the way it's depicted is looking. Above us. Now we'll look at Operation Fishbowl, where tests were done to learn about nuclear bombs in space. Johnston Island was the center of launch and experimental activity for the 1962 high-altitude weather effects test in terms 
Operation fishbowl, huh? Okay, now the fishbowl makes sense. I get it. Joined later by Nike Hercules and Stripey units, plus a second store pack on Operation Fishbowl. Chapter 6 <laughs> The Hidden Truths of Fishbowl. This chapter talks about Operation Fishbowl, a part of a bigger project called Operation Dominic, where the U.S. tested nuclear weapons high up in the sky during the Cold War. They wanted to see how nuclear bombs would work in space. It sounded like they wanted to blow up the firmament and see uh, see what God was going to do to them. That's what it sounded like to me. That's what they've been doing. Yeah. That's what they've been doing. If you listen to Hillary's uh, speeches when she was running for president, some of her speeches she talked about, uh, we, we got a, uh, we've got we cracked a million cracks through that, that glass dome. And some other stuff but uh they mention it all the time even in simpsons where they hit the baseball and it hits the dome and it cracks open and all the water rushes in yep i've seen that and how they could affect the earth's magnetic field these tests started in 1962 and were done over the pacific ocean they tested how nuclear blasts behave in space and their effects on things like communication systems there were several I important they tests, did. like bluegill starfish and kingfish Starfish even made a temporary radiation belt around Earth. The text also touches what? on human attempts to break through what feels like a ceiling above us. Referencing Hillary Clinton's speech about ah. breaking ah. the glass ceiling. SpaceX's ah. rockets. I love this video. It knows us already, bro. <laughs> and the curved path they take over the ocean. It suggests these are not just random events. Then, it shifts to discussing the sun and moon. Referencing verses from Isaiah 40 in the Bible. These verses talk about God's creation of the earth and the heavens, painting a picture of the world as a tent with the sun and moon inside. This sets the stage for a discussion on the physical and spiritual structure of the world, according to scripture. Psalm 19 says that the sky shows God's glory and the universe proves his work. Every day and night, they reveal knowledge and speak to us without using words. They reach everyone, everywhere. God made a home in the sky for the sun, which shines bright and travels across the sky, warming everything. Genesis explains that the sun and moon were made after the sky separated the water. This sky, or tent, is laid out over a flat ground, not a round one, according to the Bible. The movements of water are often thought to be because of the moon's gravity. Depending on what version you read, right? <laughs> gravity. But the Bible ah, shows ah, it's all. Rewind. Rewind. What rewind what? like 20 seconds back. Right there. Not round one. Listen to what he tells you. Five. The movements of water are often thought to be because of the moon's gravity. But the Bible shows it's all part of God's plan. Uh, uh, rivers. I like it. I agree with that. I don't think. Then I say, that. Where did I say? Where, where did I say it come from? Black what? hole sun, won't you come? <laughs> and what? Rain, won't you come? Won't you come? Black won't you come? Won't you come? Black hole sun. <laughs> yeah well i mean it, it, there could be something to it flow into the sea but it never fills up they return to where they started this cycle is not just due to natural forces but is under god's control in psalm 104 god set the moon to mark the seasons and the sun knows when to set this shows that the so that means the you, that means that the Marks our calendar. So that means that there's 13 months, 28 days. Yeah. Because the moon cycle is 28 days. Hmm. And it's the same as a uh, woman's uh, menstrual strike cycle, too. Yep. It's got something to do with our native ancestry of turtle shell, too. Changes are directed by God not by natural laws. 
The story of Joshua shows God's power over the sun and moon. When Joshua needed more time to win a battle, he asked God to stop the sun and moon, and God did. This shows that God controls the universe, not the other way around. Well, yeah. Revelation talks about a time when the sun will turn black and the moon will turn red. This suggests... Whoa, 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 whoa. The moon will turn red. What did we just have? We had a blue moon is what we had. The sky causes eclipses, not just the positions of the sun and moon. The Bible offers a different view of the world than science does. Politics. It presents the idea that... But haven't we had blood red moons? Yes. Here later. Yep. That's what I was thinking of before I said blue moon. I was like, I'm pretty sure we had a blood red moon. That God is in control of everything, including the sun, moon, and stars. If you believe the Bible, it challenges modern scientific explanations of natural events. In Revelation chapter 6, it mentions stars falling to earth like figs from a tree shaken by a strong wind. This makes us wonder how stars, if they were really far away, could fall to earth so quickly. This leads to the idea that maybe stars are closer than we think. The Bible has different views on stars. For example, Job mentions stars not shining brightly and being impure in God's eyes, yet they sang joyfully when the earth was created. Psalm 147 says, God knows each star by name, and Psalm 148 tells stars to praise God. Each star is unique, as 1 Corinthians points out that each has its own brightness. What if each star is a representation of our souls? And if we fall, then that star falls. Bingo. Daniel describes the Bingo. raining like stars, yes, sir. suggesting stars could represent goodness. However, Jude compares disobedient angels to wandering stars, punished with eternal darkness, hinting that stars could make choices and even rebel. This leads to the question, are stars like angels, capable of thinking and defying God? The Bible seems to hint at this. Finally, Revelation 12 talks about a dragon pulling down a third of the stars to earth, symbolizing angels who joined a rebellion against God. A dragon pulled down a third of the population, too, didn't it? In history. These fallen angels, like fallen stars, show that even celestial beings can choose the wrong path. I suggest this oh. idea. What if every shooting star is actually an angel choosing darkness over light? Oh. If that's the case, then wishing on them means you're choosing darkness, too. Revelation links falling stars oh, yeah. to the sky choice. I need to hear that again. Little star, how I wonder how you are. Yep. Hot in sky. Holy cow, dude. My wife sings that song Twink. to Ella. That's Ella's favorite song from her mom to sing. Wow, dude. Uh, I'm Twinkle. Wow. Star, how I wonder where you are. Bible seems to hint at this. Finally, Revelation 12 talks about a dragon pulling down a third of the stars to earth, symbolizing angels who joined a rebellion against God. These fallen angels... A lot of Revelations references. Angels, like fallen stars, show that even celestial beings can choose the wrong path. I suggest this idea. What if every shooting star is actually an angel choosing darkness over light? If that's the case, then wishing on them means you're choosing darkness, too. Damn. Revelation links falling stars to this dark choice. In Revelation 9, a fallen star. Sounds like that's the case with the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star song, doesn't it? Gee whiz, man. Described as a being, is given a key to a deep, dark pit, releasing smoke and locusts from within, which darkens the sky. It's unclear whether this fallen star, called He, building your online business. Oh, oh, oh. Well, pause it, pause it.
is the same as Abbott. Did he say he? Huh? A star called he? Is that is that what he said? Who said? The commercial? The the guy No, the guy talking. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Deep dark pit, releasing smoke and locusts from within, which darkens the sky. It's unclear whether this fallen star called he is Yeah, called he. Yep. <laughs> What you oh, got? Oh shit! What you got? The third temple coin. He charged me to build a temple. Okay. What does that mean? Remember the 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 uh, the, the third temple coin I showed you with Donald Trump yep. and Osiris the Great. Yep. And at the bottom, it talked about he charged me to to build a, a a temple for him in Jerusalem. Yeah, but it doesn't say God. Right. He said that there's a fallen star named He, and that's the angel of the falling entity that is powering him. Son of a bug. Oh, that gave me chills, dude. That made me want to cry. Yeah, dude, that gives me massive chills. Wow. Whoa. Wow. There was a reason why I, I kept pointing that out that he charged me and I kept Yeah. I kept saying who is he? Who is he? If it's yeah, not yeah, God, yeah. who is he? Yep. Yeah, I remember you asking that. And and we I didn't I wasn't putting it together, but now I understand. Liking this video. Yeah, man. This video is awesome. I'm gonna have to save this in my playlist for sure. This is awesome. He, huh? That's also, uh, isn't that also the periodic element for helium? Or is that HI? Is that HE or HI? Anyway. It's HE. -E. Is it HE? Yeah. It's the same reason why we get our toys, our, we had this one toy called He Man. Yep, he man, she ra. Wow, is the same as Abaddon, the angel <coughs> ruling the pit, or if they are different. But this story connects stories. It's unclear whether this fallen star called He is the same as Abaddon, the angel ruling the pit, or if they are different. But this story connects stars and angels with rebellion and punishment. This idea offers a new way to think about what we see twinkling in the sky, reminding us that not all that glitters is good. Lastly, <laughs> we'll explore the mysteries of Antarctica, a place with hidden secrets under the ice. Chapter 7, Unveiling Antarctica's Hidden Secrets. Discussing Antarctica from a biblical viewpoint requires understanding true world structure. This background sets the stage for our discussion. In Antarctica, there's a mysterious opening in the ice that worries many, and some even think it connects to the bottomless pit from Revelation. One possible location well, yeah, is the Weddell Peninsula. Yes, because the, 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 the Antarctica is the Arctic Circle. It goes all the way around the Earth. And that's where it talks about in the Bible, where he bound the rest of the angels besides... Uh, the mean ones were bound in under the Euphrates. Yeah, and the, and the, the rest, river, isn't it? Yes, and then yeah. the rest were bound in the, the Arctic Circle. It and tells that, you in the Bible, it says Arctic Circle. It doesn't say Antarctica. It says Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. It said three of them were bound in the Euphrates, didn't it? Didn't it? Yeah. Wasn't it specific about three fallen angels? An area of open water amid sea ice in the Weddell Sea, which mysteriously appeared and reappeared after several decades. Another possibility involves Antarctica's subglacial lakes, like Lake Vostok, which are lakes under the ice. Not actual holes, but still intriguing due to their hidden ecosystems and extreme conditions. A third like dude found on National Geographic and then went missing 
in the helicopter accident he was talking about. Third, more speculative idea comes from alleged secret diaries of Admiral Byrd. These diaries, mostly shared through YouTube or Wikipedia, tell of his supposed journeys to hidden worlds beneath Antarctica. These huh. stories, filled with descriptions of lost civilizations, dinosaurs, and remnants of old wars, sound like something out of a King Kong movie. I bet they do. While exciting. You know, I bet they get some of our best movie material from that son of a bitch over there, too. Remind one of the kind of elaborate tales found in old internet blogs. The because, did you ever watch King Kong? I haven't, no. Okay, the newest one, uh, when they, 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 uh, this one creature that they made, uh, starts destroying things and they need Kong to come help, uh, destroy this thing, uh -huh. along with Godzilla with Godzilla. And so, um, this girl is talking to Kong and it be, right in the beginning before she starts like feeding him and doing all this stuff and like, uh, all that stuff. The first thing Kong does is he grabs a, a, a big ass pine tree and he yanks all the branches off and then he takes it and throws it a, like a spear and it breaks into living in. It breaks into he's living on an island. He's living on an island uh -huh. where nobody can find nobody nobody can find him. And he's inside this dome. And in the big picture, the first thing that they show you is Kong is running wild through the forest and he takes this big old tall tree that's uh it's like a big old pine tree. He takes it. He yanks all the branches off and he throws it like a spear and he, he breaks the dome and it goes right to the dome and it holds it like that. Huh. <laughs> but it's that movie, um, Kong has to go to the underworld and he that's what he was talking about. There's a big old cave system that goes down into the underworld to the pit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's, where they, that's where they've been going. They've been going to the pit. That's where a lot of our... our um, Technology comes from it are the fallen ones, um, but there's certain name for all these angels. There's uh, certain name, just different names for them. But there, the um, see a lot of people. It's. But go ahead. I mean, how, how long is this thing? Uh, we got two more minutes and 46 seconds. Let's go. Flying between history and imaginative storytelling. Admiral Byrd is highly regarded due to his famous explorations and connections with famous people, including the president. However, I believe that the ultimate truth comes from Jesus Christ. There you go. Byrd was part of the elite involved in a system contrary to Christian teachings. In contrast, the true foundation should be Christ, as understanding him and his words leads to real truth about our world. Yes. Job chapter 38 highlights God's power in creation. He asks who laid the earth's foundations or set its boundaries. This passage describes God controlling the sea, the weather, and the day itself challenging us to acknowledge his authority over nature and our lives. It teaches that God's creation is beyond our full understanding and control, reminding us of his ultimate power and our need to respect his boundaries. In the book of Job, God explains to Job how he controls creation, including how he keeps the seas within their boundaries. Water naturally levels itself and will flow into any space available, but God has set limits to keep the oceans in place, as if sealing them within edges. This questions Living. the idea of an earth without clear edges, like a ball. Many in the truth community explore theories about what lies beyond the known world, suggesting there could be more beyond the ice surrounding us. But I think focusing too much on what's outside our current knowledge can distract from more important inner truths. 
Could the vast icy expanse of Antarctica hold keys to our past, or perhaps secrets not yet fully understood? Is there more beneath the ice than just land and water? Maybe truths waiting to be discovered. Share your thoughts and theories with us. Pretty awesome. Awesome. Good video. Dude, that, 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 I'm, uh, I'm glad we watched that video, dude. I, I actually, dude, I was going to go to bed. I'm too. glad I, I stayed up. I was too. <laughs> you know, the Lord works That's in like, mysterious ways, brother. I was like, when he said he, that uh, all of a sudden, dude, my whole spinal cord just froze. It just like, yeah, something like, dude, yeah. wait, did you just say he? Yep. And I'm like, hmm, so where I'm do I know that? I'm subscribing to this channel. This channel is called Eternity. We're going to give that video a good old thumbs up. We're going to save that in my daggum home and garden playlist we're gonna save that on the nature around us playlist we're gonna save that on uh videos i like and watch playlist so we got it on three of our playlists right there if you want to see the whole video and it's entirely on your own time even in closed caption if you want you can play it at uh different speeds if you like even you could slow it down speed it up makes it a lot more fun yeah well that was a really good watch right there that was probably one of the best videos i've seen in a while as far as information is concerned dude that was just <laughs> that i'm leaving him a comment on that one I mean, that was absolutely worth comment, like, share, all of it. Absolutely brilliant. My friend Drew and I agree. <laughs> so. We watched this that together and we're blown hell. away. How's that sound? I was... I mean, it, it was almost like... Is it... It almost... Like all the stuff that I talk about. But it's like... I want to talk about in one little video, but not everything. Yeah. That I want to talk about. That's a good part of flat earth. You see, that's why I explained, you know, people need to pay attention to, you know, this Nibiru shit. They want to, you know, talk about this Nibiru shit, you know, that it's, you know, this orb next to the sun. Well, if you just go look up the, the book of Enoch's and it explains it all. Yeah. It explains, you know, all the levels of the tracks of uh, of heaven, you know, the, the, the sun, the moon, the tracks that they're on, different levels. Okay. Where they took Enoch up and showed him all the heavens, the seven heavens, and uh, showed him God's. As he looked up, shocked because he saw God orb next to the sun. It's a chariot. It's got uh six. Uh, what was it? Uh, six angels on each side with uh, burning flames, and uh, so that's what once come with. That all that shit, all these pictures that they're getting up in this orb, that's because God's getting ready to take his world back. He's getting tired. He's tired. Once his world, but I got, I got to get to bed. I'm tired. Me too. I did want to read you this before we go though. Uh, the comment I left, I said, absolutely brilliant. My friend Drew and I agree. We watched this together and we're blown away. Info we already knew was some we didn't. Great presentation, saved to our playlist, shared, and we made a Clapper Live video with it to share on Rumble. Thank you. How's that sound? Dude, that's just... I mean, you got to give a badass comment with a badass video, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was a badass video. Brother, I appreciate you spending some time with me tonight. Somebody smacks you in the face, don't take it personal. Just focus 
and uh, smack them back with a Joe Carter or not. <laughs> You're great. You're worthy of love and great wealth today is wonderful. <laughs> love you, brother. Hope you have a great day tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow evening. Gotta focus. Yep. Mayana. Mm -hmm. Doses. Much love.